Greetings YouTube. Today I'm going to review The Affluent Society by John Kenneth Galbraith. This book was originally uh, published in 1958, though I believe that there have been additional uh, versions of it released at a later date. I believe there may have been one as late as 98. Uh, this is a book on economics. And economics can be dry. What saves this book from being overly dry, even though that there are entire passages of the book where the author discusses some very detailed uh, statistical information, lots of numbers are thrown at you, lots of economic theory and history is thrown at you. But what saves it is the author's command of the English language. It is some of the best writing I have ever read. And I'd like to read two short passages to you, uh, both as an example of what he's writing about, how he writes, um, and some uh, salient points that deal with economics and his view thereof. Um, this first passage deals with marketers, people that are in the business of want creation. Um, were it so that a man on arising each morning was assailed by demons, which instilled in him a passion sometimes for silk shirts, sometimes for kitchenware, sometimes for chamber pots, and sometimes for orange squash, there would be every reason to applaud the effort to find the goods, however odd, that quench this flame. But should it be that this passion has, uh, was the result of his first having cultivated the, de the demons. And it should also be that his efforts to ally it stirred the demons to ever greater and greater effort. There would be a question as to how rational was his solution. Unless restrained by conventional attitudes, he might wonder if the solution lay with more goods or fewer demons. In essence, Galbraith is discussing the concept of, is our society better served by pursuing the material goods of our world to a lesser extent, so that we have funds for other and more important things? Or should we continue to pursue an endless cycle of production and consumption of meaningless gadgets and gihaws? generated by demons. And second passage, a little bit longer, but well worth the effort. It is self-explanatory. An affluent society that is also both compassionate and rational would, no doubt, secure to all who needed it a minimum income essential for, the dec for decency and comfort. The corrupting effect on the human spirit of a small amount of unearned revenue has unquestionably been exas uh, exaggerated, as indeed have the character-building values of hunger and privation. To ensure e in each family a minimum standard as a normal function of the society would help ensure that the misfortune of parents, uh, deserved or otherwise, were not visited upon their children would help ensure that poverty was not self-perpetuating. Most of the reaction, which no doubt would be also almost universally adverse, is based on obsolete attitudes. When poverty has a majority phenomenon such as action could not be afforded, a poor society, as this essay has previously shown, had to enforce the rule that the person who did not work could not eat and possibly it was justified in the addition added cruelty of applying the rule to those who could not work or whose efficiency was far below par. An affluent society has no similar excuse for such rigor. It can use the forthright remedy of providing for those in want. Nothing requires it to be compassionate, but it has no high philosophical justification for callousness. That right there, folks, is some beautiful writing. I truly wish I had discovered Galbraith uh, 30 years ago, which I could have. This book was written in 1958. Um, this man had some very profound things to say. Now, the bulk of this book deals with the history of uh, economics, how Western economics 
in particular how economics in America was structured. Um, it deals with social Darwinism. I did a video recently dealing with social Darwinism that was inspired by reading this book. It's not a very big book, but it's a lot of dense reading. This is not a simple read. This is not something you're just going to breeze through, but it's worth the effort. You're really going to get something out of this. Now, one of the things that Galbraith brings up here, and I'm, I got to show you a picture of, uh, of the man. That this is just the quintessential essence of a college professor. Um, but is he puts forth the idea that an unemployment is essential for any society, and that unemployment payments should be tied directly to the level of an unemployment that a society is experiencing. And by this he means that when unemployment is low, unemployment payments should be, say, be at half the level of the previous paycheck you had at before you lost your job. So if you're making $1,000 a week and you lose your job, unemployment is low, you would get $500 a week. But as unemployment rates rise, so should the amount of payments to the person receiving unemployment. So as if the unemployment is twice as prevalent, you might get $750 a week instead of $500. And the reasoning here is that by doing this, the impact on society's economic structure does this, as opposed to doing this lessening the impact of recessions and completely mitigating depressions. Yes, Galbraith is a progressive individual believing in a progressive tax structure, which I happen to also believe in. What's the most difficult part of this book for me is that we have lost so much since this book was written, because when he wrote this book, the conservative politicians in America had not yet begun their war on the public sector and the middle class. That war had not been waged. He was speaking from a position where things were so much better. There had been no scorched earth policy created by the conservative politicians of America, funded by all that money from the wealthy who bribed them to destroy the middle class in an effort to make themselves even more wealthy. In 58, he's asking the question, are the rich too rich? And they were too rich in 58, and they're too rich in 2012. And we have lost so much. The balance between private sector and public sector, he calls the social balance. And he felt was, was like this at that time in 58. But now it's like this, where the, the social balance is completely askew. It is broken. The public sector has been decimated. And the private sector has been put onto a pedestal that no man can touch. He discusses the concept that if someone creates a useless device and creates a want for that useless device, that we as a society worship him and applaud him and think that he is a great man. Whereas if someone brings, comes forth and says, here is a new public service that will help benefit all of humanity, we lambaste that individual and call him names and vilify him. And that is sick and warped and twisted. And it was sick and warped and twisted in 58, and it is a thousand times worse now. I'm keeping this book just for the list of things in the back that suggests for other reading. I actually have some of the books that were suggested here. I found them at a, uh, a donation where someone had donated an entire section of their library. I bought five volumes, all of them buff roughly from the same time period, which I will be reading over the next uh, probably six or seven months, that deal with uh, economics and deal with society and how our economic structure and how religion and all of this is colluded together to create the mess that we have in America today. I highly recommend this individual. I apologize that a review on a book that deals with economics is so long, but it's worth your time to read this book. 
I'm going to go and hunt down more of Mr. Gal Galbraith's books simply for the fact that his command of the English language is so great that it will be a pleasure to read anything that he writes.